Hey, so you can hear me. So I'm Lewis Smithingham. I'm from 30 Ninjas. I'm a VR DP, VR supervisor, whatever the correct word is. I'm a VR guy. I was introduced last night as VR dude. Um, because this is a new industry, a relatively new industry, so there aren't really the correct titles yet. And we kind of end up doing, as you guys know, a little bit of everything. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about editing techniques today, specifically on the narrative series I'm doing right now, directed by Doug Lyman. It's called Invisible. Um, it's a mini-series. It's five or six five-minute episodes. It's presented by John, Samsung, and Condé Nast Entertainment. Um, it's, I can't show you footage from that, but I'm going to show you footage from some other stuff that relates to that. Um, it's totally insane. I can say it is the most crazy VR piece I've I've seen to date. Um, so, what I will show you in a little bit is some clips. Oh, I'm not on the screen. Uh, what I will show you is some clips from when, whenever Doug makes a movie, he makes a short film first to try out his ideas. And that's every movie he does, he does this, which is insane. I, can, I can't even imagine the short film for Born Identity. It's just crazy. So, this summer I got a call um, to do a, a short film with Doug. Um, based on this insane script they sent me that had invisible characters and violence and insanity and he wanted to shoot in VR and I said yeah, great, let's do it. And so I'll show you some clips from that short film that have terrible VFX in them, I'm sorry, terrible thing, but it's the idea. I'm going closer, okay cool, thank you Nick, Nick is amazing over here. Alright, so, moving on. So, the first thing I'm going to show you is an edit, the best editing technique. You can leave the presentation after you've seen this, because now you know how to edit VR. So this is my cat, Lola. It's a laser pointer. Watch how you edit in VR. So right now, cat sees a laser pointer, is interested, is following it. In headset, a cut. But she can follow the cut, because it starts again right in front of her. Now. I'm going to cut again. She can't follow the cut. Just ruined the cut, just took her out of the space, just ruined presence. That's how you cut in VR. That simple. The most important thing, I don't care what you do, I don't care if you make people sick, to be totally honest. If that's what you want to do, do it. Please. Um, find the brown nut. I've been trying to, I can't find it. I do have a puke bucket underneath my desk that does get used. Um, we had a moment recently where we were shooting on a boat and Doug said, you know, like, I kind of want to, like, make them feel anxious. I want to make them feel sick. And it's like, can we find that space between, like, puking and just feeling weird? So we tried to find that and that was a lot of fun to, to find. <laughs> um, but what I'm trying to get at is the thing that you can't do and you absolutely cannot do because it sucks for the medium and will ruin it for all of us is bore people. Don't bore them. Exactly. Keep them interested, keep them on target, follow their attention. Empathy, all of that is great, but it will not land if you are bored. If you are bored, if your viewer is bored, they will turn off their headset, or in this case, they will stop and start cleaning themselves or something. I hope your users don't do that, but maybe. <laughs> so, moving on. So, when I edit, I think about a cone of action. You know what a cone is, right, everybody? I edit with an overlay on top. This overlay on top of my edit allows me to view my, or track at least, where my cone of action is landing. And it gets larger and larger, or narrower and narrower as the scene progresses. So you start out big, because people are, at least for right now, people are like, oh wow, I'm in VR, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. But then eventually, people start catching onto the narrative, and they start following, and it narrows and narrows and narrows. It goes from, you know, your action may be playing all the way across your screen. This is an echo rectangular, so this is 360 playing all the way across your screen, and then it make it narrower, narrower, narrower. Now this is measured out, so this, each two bars is about the size of an Oculus DK2 or a CV1. CV1 maybe comes out to about here. Vive comes out to about here. I have a secondary overlay for each headset. A, a Samsung Gear is pretty solidly between these bars. Um, this is super helpful as well when you're, sh when you're editing to know, okay, this is what's in the field of view of my viewer. This is what they can see because sometimes you'll frame a shot and you thought it was in viewer because you're running around the set like this, but it's not. You just missed it 
And now in post, like, what you thought was a two shot is now a one shot, and you just ruined it. And you just bored your audience because now they can't follow the story. Remember, boredom is bad. That's the only rule of VR. Everybody's going to tell you there's rules, or maybe people won't. I don't think people at this booth tend to, but people will tell you there are rules of VR. There's not. Just don't bore people. But the thing that we do have to keep in mind right now is viewer sophistication is not quite there yet. Now, that I don't mean this pretentiously. It's just simple mathematics. There are younger generations that are saturated with images and have been saturated with images from a very, very early age to see hundreds and thousands and actually, in some cases, millions of images a day since they were an infant. Um, I grew up in the digital age. Um, I didn't see millions, but I saw thousands. I mean, I've had a cell phone for a long time, a smartphone for a long time. I look at it daily. I must see millions of images. So people are more used to seeing cuts and seeing images and they can, they can actually understand what images are at a much faster rate than people normally can or could in the past. That's also known as the persistence of vision in film theory. So it's where, in film theory, it's where if you have a black frame alternating between a white frame, frame, black frame, white frame, black frame, right, white frame, the point at which they turn gray is the point at which you cannot discern individual frames. That point has become substantially different over time. If you consider that a lot of projectors in the 20s were at 16, even 12 frames a second, now Ang Lee has a projector going at 120 frames a second. We're able to discern unique individual images better. Now this is a chart of um, an educational theory. It's called the zone of proximal development. It, the guy who invented it has a name that I can't pronounce that starts with a Z. Um, so it's about, here's what a, learn, a learner can do unaided. This is what they can do with guidance, editing. And this is what they cannot do. They cannot understand. There is a point at which your viewer will not be able to understand I don't know where that is. I don't think any of us do. It, it is discernible for, for frames and unique images. There is an editing speed at which it just becomes a blur. But in terms of understanding a narrative, at what speed we can understand a, a narrative, at what speed it becomes just a zoopraxiscope, I don't know. We should figure that out. But I use this chart to think about when I'm editing VR and think about as people are, you know, people who grew up with video games, grew up playing FPS shooters. When they, you put on a headset on a kid who just grew up doing that, Right away they get it. Right away they understand. Somebody who didn't, there's a little bit of a learning curve. Their zone of proximal development is a lot smaller. Their circle is tiny. A kid who grew up, grew up playing first person shooters since they were five or younger, they're gonna have a huge zone that they can do on themselves without help. Um, now, the other thing that we have to talk about is how much headsets suck. Uh, they do, they're awful, they're garbage. That also affects, in, in great ways, how sophisticated we can get with our editing styles and our visual visual techniques, because it's just like sometimes you just can't see it. Um, I got a vibe a couple months ago after editing for a few months in a DK1, or DK2, sorry, and it was like watching a different movie. It was insane how different it was between the two. The larger field of view, the better, the better resolution. So we need to take that in mind while we're editing. Um, now, this goes back to speed as well. I find that as action converges, as your, as your image, your cone of action condenses, you're able to get faster. We have some fight scenes that are very fast, but they start out pretty wide, and it's the sort of thing where, like, if you're looking and you're watching the movie, the fight scene starts out big and then starts to condense into a smaller and smaller area. So you can follow the quick cut. So that when I'm cutting to a close-up, it's there and it's right there, and then I can cut out really, really quick. You have to make sure you're maintaining your audience interest, though. Now, I in our scene, I, I think it's pretty easy. It's like there's a blank wall back there, and there's a fight here. What are you gonna watch? I mean, maybe you watch a blank wall. I don't, I don't know. If you do, I'm sorry. I'm not making a movie for you. I don't care. Um, that sounds cruel, but I don't really like this obsession with like. Oh, we need to pander to the people that are going to be wandering around not following the story is, is stupid. If, if Fellini did that, you wouldn't have... A, yeah, we're not even going to go there. Now, so I'm finding that an average cut of about one every 10 seconds. Now, that's an average. So that means I have some cuts coming like one every two seconds in some instances. But over a five-minute episode, I'm usually averaging, averaging a cut every one to 10 seconds. Sorry, no, every one every 10 seconds. This is consistent with Hitchcock-era cutting speeds. Um, which is interesting when you think about Moore's Law and you think about the way 
our, our learning curve has been, is so much more drastic. This industry is ramping up so much more faster because of computing and also because I think of sophistication of image processing within our own minds. And I find that really, really exciting, really, really interesting and thinking about how like in just a couple years we'll be able to cut really fast because everybody will understand it right away. Um, but right now we're in Hitchcock era, which is a great place to be. But you know, we're straddling Hitchcock era and 20 silent era because people keep making up crazy rules. Um, I, I, I know I keep harping on the rule thing, it just it bums me out so much when I hear people saying, you can't cut, you, you need to think about it not like a movie, you need to think about it this other thing. It's, I'm sorry, I'm making movies, I'm making them in 360 degrees, which is exciting and is in a different way of telling a story, but we're still making a movie where we're still entertaining people and we're trying to bring them into this story. In the same way when I watch a Terry Gilliam film, which is shot in a 14 millimeter lens, by the way, guys, which a lot of VR is shot in lenses close to that, I'm brought into the story. I feel like I'm in the space. When he cuts, I'm not like, oh, whoa, whoa, what happened? I can't, oh, whoa. You know, and it's the same thing. Like when Griffith is cutting between scenes and in doing parallel editing in Birth of a Nation, I'm sorry, it's an offensive film, but it's, it's history, I'm sorry. When he's cutting between these scenes, People were like, Griffith, you're insane. Nobody will understand it. You'll, you know, it'll be awful. The reviews, if you read some of the reviews of Birth of a Nation, they aren't critiquing the racism. They're critiquing the, like, this movie is just is nonsense. It's communist insanity with, whoa, what are they doing? It's so confusing. You know, people said the same thing to the Lumiere brothers. You better watch out. You know, you're, you're probably going to get sued for killing somebody because, you know, they're going to be so terrified of this train, you're going to cause a riot. And he did in some cases. And I just think it's like, dude, have you ever read a history book, man? Like, that stuff was said back then, and now you have irreversible, where a camera spins like this, or you have other movies, you have Ang Lee shooting it in 4K for each eye at 120 frames per second. Let's, let's grow up, guys. Um, so, with that said, without good UX, your story is uncomfortable. It absolutely is. Now, I tend to make what I call couch VR. That's where I can sit down and I can watch it and be stoked on the fact that I'm sitting down. I don't have to be standing, spinning, and getting more dizzy than I already am. Um, that, and that brings me to thinking about like when you're talking about editing and you're talking about blocking in VR, like how often in real life are you looking behind yourself? Not that often, guys, right? Like you look like, yeah, thanks, Nick. You look, you look when you're scared, you look when you hear a sound, or you look when something walks towards you and keeps going past you. That's when you turn behind you. And think about that when you're editing, and think about when you're directing VR. With that said, I talked about the brown note earlier. It is, there are serious health concerns. There are things where we've been cutting, and it's like, man, what if you have epilepsy? That could be a thing. Now you put a warning sign, but hey, maybe you want to give people seizures. I, I mean, I don't know. Like, that's weird, and you need to get a lawyer, but you know, his Christ was made for a reason. Weird art is made for a reason. People do stuff. Brackage did insane stuff. Maybe that's what you want to do. It's not my place to limit you. Um, with that said, if you're making a piece that you want to entertain people and you want to have them watch and sustain, in our case, for 30 minutes, <laughs> you, need, you need to be concerned about how people feel physically while they're watching. I don't mean emotionally, I don't mean empathy or anything like that. I mean like, does it hurt your neck to watch the movie? If it hurts your neck to watch the movie, you're not going to watch for more than a couple minutes, at least from my experience. It's just, I mean, I don't. I don't like having to go like this if I'm sitting down. I want to sit down at the end of the day, watch some VR, and relax. There's a movie called Sonar. I don't know if it's showing here. It's an awesome example of that. You turn around a couple times, but most of the time you have a field of view that shifts like this. Um, so, talk about parallel editing briefly. I have a couple examples of this. Um, I'll actually, I'll bring up the examples all at the end so that I'm not having to jump between two programs. We talked briefly about Griffith, um, and I'll bring that up as well. So, editor's DP. What's great about VR is I come from a post-production background. <laughs> DP doesn't have the same power as they used to. Sorry, guys. Um, the editor plays such a huge role on set and the person who's in charge of UX and thinking about how your framing is going to be used in post and how you're going to cut because there are certain shots you can just say, man, that's gonna cut weird. Particularly looking down or looking up is really hard to cut to. Really, really hard to cut to. Um, this is a shot of me in Haiti uh, with my amazing team. Uh, sh I ended up hiding underneath that tripod right after the shot. It was brutal. So shooting with a jaunt. So tricks. On set, use a compass. 
have your scripty take notes of what compass direction you were shooting in. Try to keep it consistent. That will help you in post a great deal. Um, use a consistent camera north. This means that when you're doing in post, you don't have to waste a ton of time rotating the sphere. I love Metal Suite for rotating the sphere, but renders take time. That time is money. When rotating your sphere, use a sheet of plexi and a dry erase pen on top of your monitor. So you can just mark things on your monitor, like this thing was here and this thing was here. Let's watch as the story progresses and figure out what you want to tell and how you want to tell it and where it is in space. It will save your monitor. I've destroyed a couple of monitors sticking my thumb through them. Um, use an overlay that is mapped to illustrate headset, on, uh, headset FOV. And most importantly, frame on set. Think about it while you're on set. Have an editor or whoever's editing, particularly if you're doing narrative, on set to talk to you about it. So I'll show you a couple examples of this stuff at work. If I can get, sorry, I'm a PC guy. Um, so yeah, there's that. So one of the things that we're talking about right now is parallel editing. This is from the camera test. Um, I'm not gonna bring you a headset. I'm just gonna show you guys an echo rectangular. If I can get it to work, okay. So this is from the camera test. This is an example of parallel editing. Uh, so it's cutting me between two scenes. It's a dude in a green suit approaching a woman in a house. Much like <coughs> the KKK coming to the rescue in Birth of a Nation. If anybody's seen Birth of a Nation. Again, terrible VFX, having to remove the drone. You can see, though, we're cutting between these two spaces. And if you line it up well in the headset, there's no reason to look behind in this shot because there's nothing behind you. There's a guy going into a house. She's inside a house as well and there's nothing on the other side of the frame. But you can use ambisonic sound and map sound to bring up noises here to have people look into these spaces. I'll show you an example of this in Premiere. So in Premiere, I have this brought up as well. Sorry, my, I'm not going to track that. Um, but I have some of my overlays up. So here's one of my overlays. This is an audio mapped overlay. So this says, you can't see it, left side, 90 degrees, left center, zero, right, 90, right side. And it plays out, and there's another overlay underneath here to show, uh, show how you map to headsets. This is, a little piece, this is a little piece that I'm gonna use to illustrate kind of action. She's running and hiding. This piece of kind of, I kept the cone of action far too narrow on this in my opinion, but it was a camera test. So she runs, and if you're following her, this next cut, which is incredibly quick, lands. If you're not following her, it's terrible and it doesn't work. That was too fast in my opinion. And that again goes into speed. Um, I've actually got to run in a second over to another speaking thing, but I'll take questions for a couple minutes.